Coming up tonight on VCU Insight. We sit down with VCU star basketball player Briante Weber, who's getting ready to graduate after his basketball career was cut short by injury. I'm Teresa Galasso. Find out what's happening here at James River Park coming up next. Some VCU graduate students are creating their own logo for a nearby professional team. All this and more. VCU Insight starts right now. From the Richard T. Robertson School of Media and Culture at Virginia Commonwealth University, named best student newscast in the Mid-Atlantic, this is VCU Insight. Good evening and welcome to VCU Insight. I'm Mark Hardison. And I'm Zabessa Tembrino. Thanks for joining us. Topping the news tonight, one of the most feared defenders in college basketball was set to shatter an all-time NCAA record before an injury ended his college career. Still, Briante Weber managed to have a stellar career at VCU. Insight's Derek Marion sat down with Weber to talk more about his career. Derek joins us now from the Seagull Center with more. Good evening, Derek. Good evening, Isabel. Briante Weber was known as VCU's Man of Steel for his exceptional ability to steal the ball from opponents. He came painfully close to setting an all-time steals record before an injury ended his college career. Briante Weber led the Rams' havoc style of play for two seasons as the starting point guard. He entered the season with a focus on breaking the NCAA all-time steals record. That was one of the biggest goals I had on the year. I mean, I knew I was going to shatter it. However, his pursuit of the record ended with two months left in the season. Weber suffered a torn MCL and ACL, an injury that ended the senior's college career. For about 30 minutes, I thought about myself. But when, when I realized it was bigger than me, I kind of thought about well, the season is over and I can't, I can't have my teammates down. Briante Weber found a way to stay productive from the bench. He helped keep his teammates focused on accomplishing their goal of winning the A-10 tournament. He ended his career at VCU with 376 steals, only 12 steals shy of the national record. Weber was on pace to break the record by nearly 50. The world knows that the record is really mine, <laughs> so... Matt Shelton is an owner and contributor for VCURamNation.com. The site covers VCU basketball. Shelton says it doesn't matter that Weber didn't set the record. He's the best all-time at stealing the ball, even if he doesn't have the total steals record. After Weber suffered his injury, the team rallied around him and promised Weber he would get to cut down the nets in Brooklyn because they were going to win the A-10 tournament for him. Throughout the whole tournament, it was ups and downs, but at the end, we, we won, and that was probably the biggest exciting moment that I ever felt in college. Weber had surgery about two months ago. His recovery is going well, and he hopes to be fully recovered by September. He won't be ready for the NBA draft in June, but he still hopes to make it to the league one day. Back to you, Isabel. Thank you, Derek. Over the last few years, the Washington Redskins have been the center of a sports debate over whether the team name should be changed. As part of a class project not affiliated with the Redskins, some VCU Brand Center students designed new ideas for the Redskins logo in hopes of persuading owner Dan Snyder to change the team's name. Students from VCU's Brand Center program have been hard at work over the last year in an effort to rebrand the Washington Redskins after the team lost its federal trademark of the name. Last year, the trademark trial and appeal board ruled that the term Redskin is considered disparaging to Native Americans. Redskin is to a lot of people what the N-word is. Um, and that's, that's just how that is. The students designed the new logo to replace the current logo like the one behind me, which shows a Native American, what some people see as racist. Brand Center senior Nelson Johnson, a fan of the Redskins, says the team needs a new name that defines the team's history and its fans. We wanted to give the people that were taking offense, give the people that weren't taking offense, and give the people that loved the team something to really rally behind. And we chose the name uh, Rebels because that's just kind of the attitude they have. The rebranding project was made up of two teams that redesigned a new Redskins logo and team name that wouldn't be seen as discrimination against Native Americans. Alex Belgrave, a loyal Cowboys fan, as he says, joined the project to bring change to the NFL. 
He's hoping team owner Daniel Snyder will take a look at the ideas. I think that Snyder's in a, a unique position to um, kind of make the change on his own rather than being legally forced to change it. Um, I think it takes a lot more guts to make that switch um, on your own will. Snyder has yet to comment on the students' new logo designs, but they have been submitted to the Redskins marketing department. Hundreds of soldiers are civilians rallied together to run for a good cause. The Virginia Memorial, Memorial 5K remembers Virginia's veterans. Kids started off the event with a free half mile run while adult runners paid an entrance fee of $25 that went toward funding educational programs at the Virginia War Memorial. Each year, the memorial has flags that are sold to honor members of the military who passed away. The course begins at the memorial, then goes through Hollywood Cemetery and back. This is the only 5K where you can run next to an active service member, and more than 800 soldiers came to run side by side with civilians. The VCU Institute for Contemporary Art is planning on being a cultural showcase for Richmond, but construction on the building has been delayed for almost 12 weeks now. Insights Ben Bill Meyer is in the studio to explain the situation. I'm here in the studio with Joseph Seipel, the Dean of the VCU School of Arts. Dean Seipel, thanks for being here today. It's my pleasure. So, the VCU Institute for Contemporary Art is scheduled to open next year, uh, sometime in 2016. But the construction for the project has been delayed now over 13 weeks. Can you explain why that is? Well, let me start out with there's never been a hard date in 2016. We've always thought towards the end of 2016, maybe into 2017. The construction delay, as I understand it, is that it's a very complex building, and there's some discussion about how they're going to do some of the infrastructure inside, and they want to make sure before they start pouring concrete that the concrete is set, concrete is set up that will actually handle the infrastructure as it has to. So it's back with the engineers, the architects, and, and there's a lot of discussion going on. We do hope to be back working again in the next, I would say in the next few weeks. I'm not exactly sure of the timing on that. But it is being worked on right now. It's just that they're not pouring concrete yet. Now we have some footage of the lot that's just waiting to, uh, to have construction started. With this delay, what kind of uh, impact is this going to have on the, the construction? And are you looking at making up that time in any way? Well, to be perfectly honest, this has been such a fast track since we started this thing that, that if you can imagine, we're going to be showing four exhibitions simultaneously in that building. We have a, a auditorium, 250-seat auditorium that's going to be programmed regularly. We just hired a, a curator and a direct, uh, deputy director for the institute. So if I can be perfectly honest, we're not so sad that it's going to take just a little bit longer because it'll give us more time to get the exhibitions together. It's a really complex problem. And so most of these exhibitions will be developed in-house. So for us to have a little extra time to make sure that we are coordinating and putting all the exhibitions together properly, getting out internationally to find the artists who are going to show here, uh, there's, in some ways, there's a little sense of comfort in this, in this extra time before we open the doors. And what is the main uh, purpose of this building? Once it's finished, what is the main purpose of it? Well, the Institute is a non-collecting museum. It means that we will not have a collection. We don't have to worry about preserving things for eternity. But we will have a really aggressive and exciting exhibition schedule. So as I said, there's going to be four galleries. There'll be rotating work constantly. So the potential for the students at VCU, and I mean all the students, not the, not the art students, but the students at VCU to see firsthand artists who come in to do installations, bringing work that's fresh, paint dry, maybe just dry, or maybe it's just audio that just got recorded. It's going to be a mix of all kinds of exciting new contemporary art forms and formats. So uh, I think we can expect to see many, many world-class exhibitions, and the, gal the galleries themselves will actually develop a kind of a kind of personality that we think will get international attention. Is that the main focus of what this building will have on the community at, uh, in Richmond? Well, it's interesting. If you look at the building, there's two different sides to the building, but there's no front and back. And that was a really, uh, that was something that we did purposefully. We want to make sure that every side of the building feels accessible to everybody. So Carver and, and Jackson Ward and the VCU community and the downtown community, the Richmond Arts District, 
and importantly the VCU community and all the VCU students. There's going to be, there will be a cafe, a, a coffee shop and a place and a reflecting pool and a place where people can sit and to use my University of Wisconsin slogan, sift and winnow <laughs> ideas. And we expect this will be a real gathering spot for both faculty, students and the community. If, if we don't include all of those groups, we will not have succeeded, but that is our intention and I know we will succeed. And we can't wait to see it open. I've been speaking with Joseph Seipel, the Dean of VCU School of Arts. Dean Seipel, once again, thank you so much for coming by. And once again, it's my pleasure. Altria volunteers are weeding out the bad and sprucing up the new at a local site. Renovations to a popular Bell Isle entrance are underway. Insights' Teresa Galasso is in the newsroom with more. Good evening, Teresa. Good evening, Mark. The 21st Street entrance to Bell Isle is being revamped and renovated for the 2015 UCI Road Championship coming to Richmond this September. Deteriorating stairwells overrun with mold and mud are being replaced with large stepping stones. Instead of dirt, plants that are native to the area are being put in, and a rain garden is being placed at the bottom of the path to catch runoff leading to the river. It's all right on the route for more than a thousand of the world's top cyclists and the expected 450,000 spectators. Amber Ellis is the watershed restoration manager for the James River Association. She says the goal of the project is to create something that will enhance the river. So we wanted to make it beautiful, but also make it um, something with a purpose as well, um, something that will help the James River. The site welcomes more than 100,000 visitors every year. The $90,000 project is being funded by Altria, so you won't see runoff like you do here in the pathway, making its way down to the James River for much longer. Bike racks along with a bike repair station are also being added to the area. Richmond Cycling Corps member Samuel Park says he's excited to see the city become a more convenient place to ride a bike. It definitely shows that Richmond is gearing towards the bike race. They're definitely doing a lot more bike-centric renovations, improvements throughout Richmond. And so this is just one more awesome thing that's happening. Construction starts any day now. The renovations are scheduled to be completed by the end of the month. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Teresa. A local community center is rebranding itself in an effort to be more inclusive. The Gay Community Center of Richmond has changed its name to Diversity Richmond. Those behind the change say the new name will allow the center to be more inclusive to women, transgenders, and bisexuals. Not only does the center have a new name, but a new logo as well. The logo was unveiled last week and features a rainbow and a pink triangle in the shape of the letter D. Both things are symbols of the LGBTQ community. While the appearance of the building will not change, diversity Richmond trucks can now be seen sporting the new logo. Chants echoed through Monroe Park last weekend as VCU students and staff came together to take back the night. Students Advocating Violence, Education and Support, or SAVES, is the student organization that planned the event. Take Back the Night began with an introduction from school's Dean of Affairs, Dr. Robert Ruben Rodriguez. VCU Police Chief John Venuti also attended, announcing a New Start initiative encouraging the audience to take a pledge to believe and support survivors of sexual violence. Survivors and supporters marched through the Moreau Park campus holding signs and calling for people in the community to take a stand, encouraging survivors to claim their bodies and their rights. A major advancement for emergency responders is taking over in our area. Dinwiddie County is the first local county to give residents the option to send a text message to 911 instead of calling to report emergencies. Insights Jade Wong has more. Once the caller or the texter disconnects the cell phone, mm -hmm. we are unable to make contact back. It's called text to 911 and already multiple states in the country have implemented this new technology. Dinwiddie County is the first in Central Virginia who has purchased it. To text your emergency, you would put 911 in the recipient box and then state whatever your emergency is in the message box. Now, if there's some reason that your message does not get sent, you will get a bounce back message notifying you that you need to be calling 911. Communications Manager for Dinwiddie Fire and EMS, Denise Crowder, warmly welcomes text to 911 in her county. 
She says it's really beneficial to a woman in Dinwiddie who is hearing impaired. Um, he could have, you know, lost his life that night because she couldn't get help to us. So had she had that um, text to 911, she would have been able to do that. The woman thanks to receive help in time, thanks to assistance from a neighbor. But in other cases, some think it may not be as helpful in all emergencies. Case manager in Richmond City, Jacqueline Weatherall, works with mental health patients. She feels it's best to make the phone call to emergency responders. I think that calling is more beneficial just because it's, it's easier to do and you're on the line with someone. You can give them the information that you need and when you're texting it may be difficult to just text accurately. And emergency departments agree with Weatherall. They say that there is a delay in response time, so citizens should call if they can, text if they can't. For VCU Insight, I'm Jade Wong. Richmond, Chesterfield, and Hanover are also looking to the Text 911 program. Good Day RVA, a local music collective, is preparing for its annual festival at Hardywood. Insight's Jacqueline Kazi is in the studio with more. Good Day RVA is only weeks away from their second annual Good Day Festival at Hardywood. I'm joined here in the studio with two of the founders, Evan Hoffman and Matt Cowan. Evan, Matt, thank you for being here today. Thanks thank so you. much for having us. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who aren't familiar with Good Day RVA, can you just give us a quick overview of what it is that you do and why you chose Richmond? Absolutely. We are a local filmmaking collective that specializes in live performance music videos of solely local bands in very unique locations around the city. Why did you pick Richmond as opposed to maybe some other smaller cities? This is our hometown. So um, you're from here? Yes. Yeah, yeah several of yeah. us are from here and uh, mm -hmm. others moved here afterward and we love the city and it, it felt right. Um, you know, we wanted to do something organically with the place we love. So. May 17th, you have a festival coming up. Uh, what is the purpose of the festival? It's actually May 9th this year. May 9th, May okay, 9th. apologize yep. about that. Oh, no problem, Saturday, May 9th. Um, our, well, this is our second annual music festival that we've had at Hardywood. And uh, last year, we kind of wanted to put out a festival kind of showcasing all the amazing local talent around town, and also just to kind of gain exposure as a film collective and let people know what we do and who we are. So we actually have some video here of the festival from last year that they're gonna pull up. Can you tell us what's gonna be different this year? What can people expect? What type of activities are gonna be at the festival? Well, first, all the bands are gonna be different. Um, we, there are so many great local bands, and uh, last year we had 14, and this year's an, a new crop of 14. Uh, uh, the, the set design will be a bit different. We're gonna go for a space uh, and prehistoric theme. Mm -hmm. uh, got two stages, one inside, one outside. And uh, yeah, it, it should be both a different and a, a very similar, hopefully, experience to last year, which is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose to do it at a brewery as opposed to maybe on the river or other right. locations around Richmond? Well, we've always admired Hardywood for kind of their, um, su the way of supporting the community. And um, they've been very supportive of the local art community and um, local social organizations and we've always enjoyed that also their space is massive and um, the beer is great and Carrie who's um, kind of manages the bands and the events it was amazing to work with and we knew that even coming in last year um, so yeah we love working with them what was yeah. the process because this is your second festival it's a mm -hmm. pretty big event so what was the process of going about getting all the bands getting the funding and planning this festival coming up it's a lot of work. It's a lot of phone calls, a lot of email correspondence. Um, and aside from all the, the 14 bands that we have to coordinate, we also have about 15 um, local artists, local vendors, local community organizations that we're going to be showcasing as well. So it was a big coordinating task, but everyone is so um, kind of on the same page and, and pumped about our mission. So uh, that made it easier. And so you guys are raising funds for the festival. Where are the funds going to? go towards? Uh, we do a series of live performance videos, so uh, we'll choose a, a band around town and match them with a location in Richmond that uh, has some sort of significance, whether historic or cultural. Uh, and then we, we pay for the production of those videos out of our own pockets. So this festival is a way to uh, kind of raise money for that project. Uh, and so we can keep it going because there are a lot of bands and a lot of locations we'd like to shoot. And very quickly, what do you have coming up next? We are focusing on our Indiegogo campaign, which we're going to um, 
have be posted um, in correspondence or around the same time as our um, festival is happening. So um, we have been focusing on that video. And um, like Matt said, we um, do an ongoing live performance music video series. So right. our next um, band we're shooting is That Spirits. That's a fantastic. Great local band, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been speaking with two of Good Day RVA founders, Evan Hoffman and Matt Cowan. Evan, Matt, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Very good. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Spring is here, and that means pollen is back in season. Probably no surprise if you've taken a look at cars around town. Insights Ben Bill Myers in the newsroom with more on the story. Good evening, Ben. Good evening, Isabel. People are waking up from their winter hibernation and are enjoying the spring weather, but it's bad news for anyone in Richmond living with allergies. VCU student Lacey Dixon says she's no fan of allergies. I mean, my eyes will get itchy if it's like really and she says they've only gotten worse during her time at college. She says she recently developed allergy-induced asthma, and she says she's noticed the same effect on those around her. And I feel like a lot more people have been getting sick. And experts say a lot of pollen falls in Richmond each year. According to the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, Richmond is the number one worst metro city in the country to live in for people with allergies. It's even received a number one ranking in four out of the past five years dating back to 2010. The list takes into account several factors, including poor air quality, a lack of public smoking bans, and a continued higher than average pollen count. But according to one official, the blame is on the winter weather that comes before spring. Well, we've had a few showers move by. John Bernier is the chief meteorologist for WRIC-TV ABC8 in Richmond. He says that Richmond's location on the map is a major factor. Being close to the Atlantic Ocean, we have an ample supply of moisture to feed into the humidity. He also says that many local trees and winter weather coming later each year are other factors. He says Richmond is the center for a perfect pollen storm. And that's when we've seen really the spring season pick up with a little more intensity and possibly concentrating this pollen production into a, a more shortened time frame. And that pollen's not going away anytime soon. The Weather Channel's latest report shows Richmond's getting more before the end of April. But Bernier does have some encouraging words for those suffering from their allergies. Hopefully everybody's allergies get a little bit better and a little quicker. Now the good news is that that list from the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America does show that Richmond has a greater than average amount of certified asthma doctors in the city. Back to you, Isabel. Thank you, Ben. High school students in Hanover County recently came up with a new program to stop underage drinking. The program is called Sticker Shock, and it's quickly gaining popularity in the area. With the help of local police, the students talk to nearby ABC store owners. If an owner is caught selling alcohol to a minor, he or she can lose their liquor license or face jail time. The program is not only endorsed by Hanover Police, but the local ABC board as well, and is encouraging students to expand it to neighboring counties. There's a new app in Richmond for people who need a cab ride. The app is called In Route and was launched by Richmond Cab Services in an effort to increase the use of area cabs. Users of the app will be able to hail a cab ride on their mobile device and pay for the ride either with cash or with their credit card, unlike services like Uber and Lyft that only allow the riders to pay with their credit card. With the rising popularity of those services, InRoute's president Chris Brevard says less people are resorting to the traditional cabs. The app is available for free on both Apple and Android phones in hopes of encouraging customers to come back to cabs. And finally tonight, with over 5,000 likes on Facebook, this musical duo has a number one hit single. Only their single isn't one here in America, it's halfway across the world. Insights Casey Young has the full story. Beth Martin has been singing since she was a little kid. Even back then, Michaela Beatley sang along. They've been singing together since the fourth grade. This is really Honestly, my whole life I've been like, I want to be a singer, I want to be a singer. They've called themselves Macbeth for years, but it became official in 2014. Manager Michael Cogden met the girls in an unusual way. Uh, he calls me up one day, young guy about Beth's age, and says, hey Michael, I just met this really cool chick at a funeral. Um, would, you, uh, would you like to meet them? Uh, they can sing. And they can also write. Their song, The Rest of Time, became number one in Taiwan back in December. 
The song was picked up by a famous Hong Kong singer-songwriter, Jackie Chung. He remade it in Chinese, and Macbeth never expected it to be such a hit in another country. Um, it's not just the guessing game of is this a hit song or is it not a hit song. And so much of that is just your gut feeling. Macbeth might have a number one single in Taiwan, but they're not going to stop anytime soon. They have so much more planned. Both the girls have day jobs at a local Richmond restaurant, but Martin says that is not her career goal. Um, obviously in the long run, like I would like to have my own act where I just tour. Martin hopes to one day to be able to support herself in music alone. It's just like Shakespeare said in his play Macbeth, something wicked this way comes. And for Macbeth, it looks like something amazing already did. For VCU Insight, I'm Casey Young. Macbeth currently has two EPs on iTunes. They've already played gigs at the National where artists like Casey Musgraves and Ingrid Mickelson have performed. Macbeth is currently working on their songs and just perfecting their sound. I love the Shakespearean reference by the, of their name. I, I, I like the name Macbeth. It's a very unique name. And that's it for this edition of VCU Insight. Make sure to check us out online at insight.vcu.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the VCU Insight. Contact us with any stories you'd like to see on our show. And if you've missed our show or like to watch it again, go to our YouTube channel under VCU Insight. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Zadessa Timbriano. And I'm Mark Hardison. We'll see you next time.